Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Open Space Commission's first lecture program of a long time. Uh, we thought we'd try to start doing some programs that would help people understand the, the nature that we have here at Timberland as well. And so this is our first attempt at doing that. Um, I thought the weather was going to be against me because it was so beautiful yesterday and everybody would be out in their gardens and so on. But it clouded up today, so I guess that helped. I think really the magic word was free. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, Open Space Commission in Tiverton is a town commission um, that's part of a partnership with the Tiverton Land Trust and Rhode Island Nature Conservancy that preserves uh, natural areas in town, preserves and manages. And this program is to help you enjoy that, understand what we have more and to be able to enjoy it more. Um, we have a great art exhibit right here that's very timely, over the river and through the woods. <laughs> so uh, after it's over, you can go by and enjoy the artwork. Uh, Jerry Feldman, is that right? Yep. Jerry Feldman, a local art teacher, uh, is responsible for this. So uh, anyway, uh, Tiverton Open Space Commission uh, is responsible for Weedamoo Woods. Uh, that's our main open space area. Uh, we also are in a long-term program to preserve another forested area north of Weedamoo Woods between Lafayette Road and Bogomarsh Road. And that's, is, we call that Pocasset Ridge. It uh, has a different, a different natural, has different natural characteristics and so on, so it'll be uh, managed a little bit differently. And, and our long-term goal is to uh, have a large contiguous forested area down there that one preserves the historical sites that we'll be talking about today along Eight Rod Way, and two uh, preserve a valuable, really valuable piece of wild nature that uh, is getting more and more rare along the southern New England coastline. So we have uh, several members of the Open Space Commission here today. So when we're done, if you have any questions about the commission and what we do and so on. There are handouts uh, back there, information pamphlets and so on, trail guides. I was expecting maybe 30, uh, low expectations, I guess. Uh, so my apologies for underestimating that, uh, but we'll make do. And if there's information you want that's you know gets exhausted back there, we'll uh, give one of us your name and address, and we'll be sure and get the brochures to you. We also manage Fort Barton, thank you, Susan, uh, as uh, the oldest open space area in town and historical site, well, oldest, one of the earliest uh, preserved areas. Fort Barton Woods, 83 acres of natural area behind the fort, and of course the historic site, the Revolutionary War site. So anyway, well, today we're gonna talk about Weedamoo Woods. Uh, history, uh, natural history and cultural history. In other words, the human history and the natural history. It's just an amazing place down there. I've been, I've been walking around woods my whole life and I've never experienced anything quite like Weedamoo Woods in terms of the, the entire display of history that's down there and the large forest, Borden Brook, Cedar Swamp, uh, the the granite outcrops, the whole collection of nature and history is just amazing. Um, it, it represents kind of a window into the past that begs to be understood more. And we're really, we're really just beginning to uh, kind of piece together what the history of that area might have been uh, because it started in, well, it started thousands of years ago when the Pocasset people first came there. And uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of the deep presence of the Pocasset Native Americans in the East Bay area 
where they farmed, fished in the summer, and then went back into the forests over the winter time. Uh, so there's remnants of that in Weedamoo Woods. Uh, you've got that history, and then in 1681, uh, the Pocasset Purchase happened. This was after the King Philip's War. Uh, the Native Americans were pretty much over in this immediate area after that war. Uh, the Plymouth, Plymouth Colony uh, then authorized a uh, division of land, the East Bay, the Pocasset Purchase it was later to be known as, and there were 30 house lots in that first division, and the 30th lot on the southern end of that whole tract, the Great Lot, is down in Weedamoo Woods. Uh, on the eastern edge of that purchase was a roadway laid out, eight rod way. A rod is 16 and a half feet, so eight rods is 132 feet. That's a fairly major roadway. Uh, and sometime in that same time frame, I think within a year or two, another purchase was, was authorized by the Crown. Uh, the Punkatees Purchase, and that went south from uh, from the uh, Pocasset Purchase, and the Eight Rod Way was continued on down. So that Eight Rod Way corridor goes up there um, through Weedamoo Woods, and there's cellar holes all along Eight Rod Way, uh, and, and other things that we'll be looking at in a minute. Um, what is really curious walking around and exploring Weedamoo Woods, besides the, the natural area, uh, is trying to explain by seeing all these cellar holes and the, the various things that are visible down there from the past, uh, piecing together sort of the history. What, you know, how come it's no longer there? How come the road was never paved over like you know, the other eight rodways and five rodways and three rodways? Why did the people leave? Uh, when did the sawmill get built? That's always fascinated me because no one knows that right now. Now that's, that can be found out. Uh, it's just no one's taking the trouble in modern times to do it. Um, so, you know, just, just looking at the whole area and wondering what the history was, uh, the, the first settlers, when did they first come? Um, Another thing that's really curious is a lot of the cellar holes are right at the edge of the swamp. Why would you establish a farm right at the edge of a swamp? That's, that's been curious to me. So uh, all of that is, uh, can be researched and found out, but it's not, to my knowledge, uh, the whole kind of detailed history uh, knowable at this, at this time. If anyone would like to write a book, I, I think th there's a book out there. So see me after the lecture and we'll <laughs> do some business. Uh, okay, the, the natural history, uh, just quickly, uh, the various, it, it's an amazing collection of habitats in, in natural communities. You've got a big cedar swamp, which uh, has some, f uh, a fairly unusual Atlantic white cedar uh, uh, forest community in it. Uh, you've got upland, you've got a, a forest community called Coastal Oak Holly. Now, I know a lot of you, if you've been reading stuff about Tiverton and our land acquisitions and so on, probably have heard of that term. That's a, uh, a forest community that's not very common. It's only found in four states, right up here where we are, where you have a collection of uh, a lot of the oak species and the American holly tree. Um, so that's, that's one of the main upland uh, forest communities. Lots of vernal pools down there, which are really interesting and valuable little ecosystems that uh, congregate around pools that are full of water in the spring, but they dry up late in the summer. So there's never fish that are, that are in them. And this supports a, an unusual suite of amphibians, salamanders and uh, wood frogs and various uh, uh, amphibian species. And so those, there's, a, there's several vernal pools throughout Weedamoo Woods that are, that are important ecologically. You've got the granite outcrop, uh, the, the ridge that Pocasset Ridge is named for, that runs north and south, kind of uh, on and off from way down in Little Compton all the way up into Fall River. And there's, there's prominent outcrops 
along Weedamoo Woods and Pocasset Ridge north of Lafayette Road. So that's another uh, little um, set of conditions that supports a different community of plants and birds and, and ground species, invertebrates and so on. So the variety of, of habitats there is really uh, pretty amazing, which makes it uh, the main reason why we're getting support from the Nature Conservancy to preserve that. Uh, it does have uh, real ecological value. And the size of it too, the fact that it's a, a large unbroken forest is pretty, uh, pretty significant. Uh, the cultural history, um, well, I've sort of already gone through that from the Pocasset uh, lands, uh, from the uh, uh, Pocasset Purchase uh, early settlement um, and uh, the sawmill at some point in time. Uh, so a, a little bit of a, actually a little bit of a commercial industrial activity down there in that, in that period. And then for some reason, abandonment at, cert at a certain time. And uh, now it's, it's down there and the forest has come back. So uh, that's, uh, you put all that together and Tiverton is really lucky to, to have that. It's, it's um, an unusual circumstance where you have something like that that's preserved and you can kind of look into the past and, and wonder about it. Uh, so, all right, well, um, let's see what I've missed here. I have here some maps that I'd like to show you. Uh, and expecting 30 people, I printed 30. <laughs> So I'd like to parcel these out, and if you could share with the, the uh, people near, nearby, uh, I would appreciate it. And again, if you miss one of these and you'd like to have one, I'll, uh, thank you. I'll um, uh, give me your address and so on, and we'll get one to you. Um, could you just start those around? Uh, we'll get one to you uh, in the mail. So take a, take a moment here. Please, uh, I'd like for this to not be a one-way discussion. If you've got comments or questions and so on as we go, and this would be a good time uh, to pause uh, uh, for a uh, for question. Hey, Ron. When I was growing up in the 1950s, uh, at Lafayette Road, many old timers referred to it as Brown Road. As what? Brown Road. Yeah. I still call it that. It's a lot easier yeah. to say than Lafayette. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they re and they, I remember they mentioned a Nancy Brown yard down there. Okay. I mean, I don't remember. All right, let me. Era, but okay. The, you, the question you? was along Lafayette Road. Everybody know where Lafayette Road is? Okay. Uh, it was known formally as Brown Road. And I think the other portion of it, the, the other, the eastern side of it was actually at one point even further back called King's Highway. Uh, you know, King Road is, is an extension over there and that came down. Uh, the, if you, if you look at King Road and extend it to the west in a straight line, now what happens, King Road goes over and hits Lafayette and then it starts wiggling around and eventually comes out on Main Road opposite Sapout Ave, okay? But if you go over to the eastern side where it's King Road and then just draw a straight line, that line comes down through and that's the division between the Pocasset Purchase and the Punkatest Purchase. So that was, that was a, a division. But the western por portion of that was never a road and, and, it, and it sort of started wa wandering around and, and now, the farm side, if, in fact, if you look at your map on Lafayette Road, well, uh, is uh, there's a brown farm there. Okay, it's, 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 it's labeled on, the, uh, it's labeled on the, the map that I passed out. Brown, HRS, that's Brown Heirs. Okay, if you can find, if you can find Lafayette Road. Well, it, it won't be called Lafayette Road. It says windmill. 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 Sorry, I wish, I wish I had a slide of this, it'd be a lot easier, but 
absent of that, this was my, uh, my way to do that. Okay. Uh, see the... Uh, all right, does everybody see the Isaac Brown windmill? Okay, windmill. Well, there's... Okay, that was a windmill, I guess. But the, the, over to the right of that is Isaac Brown heirs. See that? Okay, okay, there's King, there's King Road. And, all right, if you take, see the dotted line that goes down the middle of that, the middle of the uh, paper? Okay, that's the old eight rod way. All right. That's the, this, this by the way, is an 1895 atlas of Rhode Island. And that, that's helpful in terms of kind of piecing together the history. 1895 Atlas of Rhode Island. This is an excerpt, of, you know, from one of the pages. They really knew how to do atlases in those days. All the houses and everything. Um, but if you'll see Eight Rod Way, the dotted line down the middle of the, uh, the paper, that's the old Eight Rod Way, the eastern boundary of the Pocasset Purchase and the Punkatest Purchase. See the little crook there right below uh, that, that King's Road or Windmill Road? That is the dividing line between Pocasset Purchase and Punkatess Purchase. And if, you, and if you, this is really not a, you know, this is a, somebody's drawing, so, but if you extended that over to the right, that would join King's Road further over to the east. All right, but anyway, the Isaac Brown uh, heirs that's the Brown House, and that's the Brown Lane. That, that lane is actually mentioned in Nathaniel Church's Diary of the King Philip's War. Uh, and they went up that lane, and they saw a bunch of rattlesnakes in the trees, and they hightailed it out of there. <laughs> so this is a good time to talk about rattlesnakes. <laughs> uh, they really weren't rattlesnakes because rattlesnakes don't climb trees. Uh, they probably were black racers that congregate with rattlesnakes a lot, and they do climb trees. So that's my, that's my supposition. Um, I don't know how many times I've been around Rhode Island, all the way up to Chapachet and so on, and someone would say, where are you from? And Tiverton, oh, that's where all the rattlesnakes are. Uh, Tiverton is famous for <laughs> Rattlesnakes. Uh, unfortunately, they are no longer there. Well, I say unfortunately. A lot of people will say good riddance. Uh, but uh, rattlesnakes, the eastern timber rattlesnake, uh, which is found in, in most of the eastern part of the United States, or was historically, uh, was really populous along that granite ridge up and down. The, the timber rattler uh, dens up in the wintertime. They all come together and den up sometimes 50 or 100 in one den uh, in some rock somewhere. And they'll den up uh, all winter long. And then in, in, the, in the spring, they start coming out and sunning on the rocks. And then eventually, they dissipate out into the woods until the fall. Uh, that's kind of their, their annual movement. Uh, the problem with that, from their standpoint, is uh, they're easy to catch and kill, you know, if you catch them in the dens. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, in 1952, and I have a copy of this letter, a local uh, citizen was, um, lived down uh, near Sapalit Avenue on Main Road, a neighbor across the street from him found a five, found a six foot rattler he claimed uh, on his porch one morning and, the, and this person had children and so he wrote a letter to the governor and said we got to do something about this uh, and a couple years after that the governor did actually sign a, a, a uh, declaration uh, making a bounty on rattlesnakes so they were paying three dollars for every dead rattlesnake you could bring in so it was not too many years after that, that they were all gone. Um, in fact, one story that, that I have of anecdote, anecdotal story was someone uh, uh, went out and killed a hundred of them one day. That's pretty good money, in, you know, in, in those times. Um, so, 
The timber rattler uh, was there uh, all along that ridge, and that's perfect habitat because they like the rocky ridges uh, for their dens and so on. So the last one that was found that was documented was 1968. In fact, Jim Holt, uh, some of you may know Jim, uh, called into the state and said he had found one. And knowing Jim, I'm sure he killed it. <laughs> Uh, he didn't like rattlesnakes either. So it's kind of a shame that, uh, you know, we weren't able to coexist with rattlesnakes because they're, you know, with any kind of care at all. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any recorded uh, incident of anyone ever dying or even being bitten, but they are scary and people don't understand, you know, them and so on, so they want to get rid of them. And that happened. Uh, a lot of people think there might still be rattlesnakes out there and it's, it's always possible. The, I think it's highly improbable. The get to you in a second. Um, the uh, herpetologist from URI over a 15-year period uh, sent came over annually during the right time for at least one day and hunted for rattlesnakes and didn't find any. Yes, sir. I was going to say there, we, we found one back uh, towards the end of Ladywood Lane where the new conservation land is. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, about when they have a, they have a rattler on it? Wow. Well, okay. I stand corrected. They might still be out there. That's that's very that's very interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, I I've not seen one. And I've you know I'm up there. I don't know how many times a year, but I'm, I'm not. Uh, I knew that. Yeah. If, if it's got a rattler on it, it's a timber rattler. So I'm really, I'm really encouraged by that because I'd, I'd like to see that species survive. Uh, they are getting, uh, they're still in a lot of states. They're very rare in New England now, uh, up in the White Mountains. I think there's, they're probably still up there. There's none in Maine that they know of. Uh, that might be getting a little far north, but uh, there's a lot of them in the Appalachians. Uh, but anywhere they're near human habitation, they tend to be killed out because people are afraid of them. So anyway. Tiverton is famous for its rattlesnakes. Uh, so now we even have some still alive. Yes, ma'am. You still have the bumpy? Uh, I don't know. I suspect that that one is. Yeah, actually, they're, they're uh, yeah, good point, Ron. Uh, they are on the state list of rare, endangered, threatened species. So it's actually against the law to kill them now. Yeah. So, I, I think it, are you in trouble? Gary, I think you still get the $3, but you have to go to jail for a year. <laughs> <laughs> that might be worth the three bucks sometimes. <laughs> yeah, is there another question here or comment? Oh, I was just wondering, because I'm from out of state and I've been here six years. Um, I've been heading to go to in, deep into Lady Moon because I'm concerned about the deer chick population. I was wondering. Well, deer, I think you're very wise to be concerned about it. Sure, there's, there's, there's a lot of deer down there and the deer ticks around. So you always, anytime you go into the woods, anywhere around here, yeah. even on your own property, it's wise to take the precautions. So. I know Rhode Island has a lower incidence of Lyme disease, but not the But it's here, it is here. Yeah, and it's a serious, a serious disease. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, yeah. Uh, okay, so so much for the rattlesnakes. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. You know, I grew up in Tiverton, and when I was young, I used to ride down a roadway. There used to be deer and different animals. Whatever happened to them? Well, they're the deer are really uh, I mean, uh, thick down there now. Oh, that was half and wrap of that old man, I think. Yeah. That on what? They were fenced in. Oh, fenced in. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. No, those aren't there. It's all wild now, but there's lots of deer down there, and that's even better. They're out in the wild. Uh, I don't think those were white tails. They were some kind of a. Uh, oh, is that right? Was, uh, that family was just keeping. Oh, I see. Uh, on the uh, the map, before we uh, start looking at slides, let me just uh, point out some other th some other features uh, that are that are interesting to me. I've I've marked the cellar holes that have been found in Weedamoo Woods. Uh, see the little squares with the CH? Uh, actually, I haven't marked all of them, but the ones that are up and down 8 Rod Way are on here. And this is not a, you know, I didn't do this with a GPS. It's where, about where I think they are. Um, and so there's, 
Well, I think most of you have been to Weedamoo Woods. That lowest one there is that Scipio Cook Cellar Hole. That's the very first one up 8 Rod Way that, that the Yellow Trail goes by. So a lot of you have seen that. And then the next two up are two of those that are uh, kind of at the edge of, a swamp, of, of the Cedar Swamp, which has always kind of made me scratch my head. But I think I've got it figured out now uh, why that is so. And uh, actually the next three are, are in that category. And then on up uh, past the, uh, the little crook in Nate Rod Way and up on north of Lafayette Road, uh, I've marked in some stone walls up there. Now this is really, an ex now this is, not, this is not open to the public yet north of Lafayette Road because we don't own, we just own a few parcels up there. We, we being either the town or the land trust or Nature Conservancy. Uh, someday when we complete uh, the long-term project, uh, we uh, hope to be taking people up there to view this. But anyway, that's an extensive farm up there, farm site. Uh, stone walls going in, uh, an extensive network of stone walls, a cellar hole. Uh, and that really is interesting to me because it's not on the map. So it was abandoned sometime before 1895. Uh, and you'll notice, you'll notice down below there, uh, down toward East Road, there's an old mill site. <laughs> well, that's the sawmill, of course. And that means that that was gone in 1895. So at some point in time uh, uh, before that, the sawmill came, operated, and shut down. And by 1895, it was called an old mill site. Laura? Maybe I'm being ignorant, but could you just give a brief explanation of cellar holes and why they're so cold? Cellar holes are cellars of home sites. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate that because I make these assumptions sometimes that everybody's seen these and kind of kno knows what they are. So, uh, all th you know, throughout Rhode Island, in the woods, you'll see these abandoned home sites where there used to be farms. Uh, sometimes they're pretty intact, where you get four walls. Sometimes, and you know, that's probably a more recent one. Uh, sometimes they're fairly large, and you can sort of see the outline of a building on it. But all of those, certainly the earliest ones that came in and where the settlers came in and, and they were more or less subsistence farms where, you know, people survived on the produce and the, that they grew in their own gardens and their own fields and in the animals that they had. Uh, that's the way they got through the, through the winter. They'd can their products, the root crops, uh, potatoes and so on. And, that, you know, so everybody had a cellar. It was also warm down there for the, the bitter winters that, uh, when there wasn't central heat and so on. Uh, so that's, that's what's left of some of these farm sites that are long gone. And we have a whole network of them here. What's, the fact that there's a cellar hole down there is pretty, I mean, that's not terribly unusual. The fact that we have this kind of whole community that is gone is what's, to me, interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, kind of the history of why and when and how, what the sequence of events were. Are these cellars uh, protected from being caved in? I mean, uh, the, some of the old ones out in the central part of the U.S., they just made pits because the hole would cave in unless they put up uh, reinforcements or stone. Well, there's been no, there's been no uh, restoration of any of these, and some of them are pretty slumped in. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I suppose uh, to, to go back and reconstruct, uh, but... No, the answer is that has not been done. Anything, they just but they are stone. Yeah, they are stone, and they're 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 fairly they're they're fairly stable. Yeah, I mean, you had to do something with all those stones out there, right? Yeah. But yeah, obviously, I mean, it was yeah. But they're still intact. Well, some are and some aren't. Some are square. Uh, the one, the one uh, north of Lafayette is fairly square. There's one I didn't mark here that's over over on the east side on our red trail that's in fairly good condition. So again, those are probably later ones when uh, the people, you know, the first people that came in were sort of just doing everything themselves. Later on where they had hired hands, slaves, some of them, uh, and the houses got more substantially built. Uh, they're, in, they're in better condition because they were better put together and they're more recent so they haven't had the, the wear of time too. So, yes sir? That one at eight, I mean, I want to 
pretty distinct and there are stairs to go down into yep. it. But it seems like, was that a little community? Because there are two or three cellars right in that general area. Right. Some yeah. of them are joining I, the wall. I would suspect that would be uh, the original house, then the son's house, and then, you know, that kind of thing. Or they may, they may have uh, uh, had an outbuilding that they also put a cellar hole on because, you know, but that little complex there uh, uh, is one of the better ones. I have a slide of that so we can we'll, we'll look at that. But yeah, you can see this stair step down. And so those are, uh, are uh, in various conditions of, of repair. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay, I'm going to I'm going to kind of reconstruct what I think the timeline was later. So I'll answer that for you later if I might. Be sure I do. Okay, uh, I that's the Scipio Cook cellar hole. <coughs> Scipio Cook, yeah, it was. Uh, it's recorded that he was uh, an occupant at one time, and it's it's kind of significant. Uh, the recorded. Uh, uh, well, again, let me let me I'll I'll, I'll back I'll, I'll do that the whole thing later. Uh, okay. What's the I'm really sorry we don't have this one of these for everybody, uh, but does everyone sort of have a chance to uh, to see that? Yeah. I, I just wondered what the, uh, the uh, single dotted line is. Well, now again, this is an 1895 atlas. I'm, I'm thinking that's probably a cart path or a trail. That's was a, was a common way to do that. And you'll notice, you'll notice that the Dotted line means that Eight Rod Way was already gone. And of course, there's no houses along there too. So Eight Rod Way has pretty well disappeared by then. So this major highway that the original, that was in the original division of land there, disappeared. Uh, is, is that the same thing as a proprietor's way? This is how they used to divide up. Well, it was. It was a proprietor's way. It was it was the eastern boundary of of the proprietor's lots. So that might have been a term that was was applied to it. Uh, one of the things that you hear is that Eight Rod Way went all the way from Plymouth, or the it was a it was a roadway all the way from Plymouth down to Sakonet Point. Uh, I've not seen any credible evidence that that's true. Uh, I think I think what you have is you have eight rod ways everywhere. I mean, when you first laid these subdivisions out, they all had eight rod ways. Uh, the eight rod way in the Pocasset Purchase went from Weedamoo Woods all the way up through Fall River because the Pocasset Purchase went, went up into Fall River just south of where 195 is now. And there's eight rod ways that go up there. And then the next subdivision had an eight rod way that went up. Uh, Punkatest had an eight rod way that connected. But I don't, I, I'm not convinced that there was a, a grand scheme that Plymouth said we're going to have an eight rod way down to Sakana, down to Sakana. I know that's commonly written, but I, I've not seen any, you know, evidence that that really was some kind of a scheme. It doesn't really make it that much difference. Plymouth Avenue is eight rod way. Fish Road is eight rod way. So some of it was eventually became town roads in a finished highway. This particular section did not. That's you know it, it disappeared. Uh, tell them what. I have 132 feet, 16 and a half feet. A rod is 16 and a half feet, and so eight eight times 16 and a half is 132 feet. Uh, okay, let's um, let's look at a few pictures. I don't have a, a whole lot here, so we're uh, and, and this will this will kind of back up what I've been talking about. If someone could, perfect. Oh, could you switch that back on for a second, please? Forgot to get my extension cord out here. Okay. Now. <clears throat> Everybody see? Uh, okay, this is Cedar Swamp. Lights again, please. If you could turn the lights off. I'm sorry. Can you raise the Well, if I raise it, it'll get off the screen. That's as high as the screen will go, unfortunately. And I've got 
a couple of vertical slides that. No. Well, I lose it. I lose a top of it though. That's uh, the middle of Cedar Swamp. Borden Brook runs down the middle of Cedar Swamp and eventually ends up at Four Corners and in Nunquid Pond. And Borden Brook is what was dammed by, to create the, uh, the sawmill works. There's one of those vernal pools I was talking about. And if you were out there right now, you might hear little quack, 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 quack sounds, which are wood frogs. They're one of the species that comes into these vernal pools in the spring and uh, there's a big orgy and they lay all kinds of eggs and then uh, they hatch and go back into the woods before the pond dries up. So they're really pretty cool little ecosystems. And here's the American holly, which is uh, the signature tree of the coastal oak holly forest community that I was talking about. And those are all through Weedamu Woods. The holly got hit hard this year, late, about the second week in March. There was a, there was a real two or three days that really froze. And so a lot of the holly, if, you, if you're out in the woods this year, are going to look a little brown. They'll survive, but they, uh, they got hit a little bit by, it was a, some sequence of humidity and freeze uh, that, that really hurt them. Uh, we're right on the northern edge of the natural range of American holly, so when we get a little extreme there, they get, they get hit a little bit, but they'll, they'll make it. And uh, this is a big, big white oak tree uh, that's not far from one of the cellar holes. And it's kind of interesting, uh, that, that tree is uh, over four feet in diameter. So it's been there probably at least 300 years. And it's what foresters call a wolf tree, which means it spreads its arms way out to the side and it's kind of round shape. Uh, what that means is that tree grew up when it was not a forest there, it was an open field. So that tree probably grew up when uh, that cellar hole was, it was actually a house and a home site there. Uh, otherwise, if it, was, if it grew up in the middle of the forest, it'd grow up and straight. It wouldn't spread out. It'd be going for the sun. So this, this was an open-grown white oak tree. Here's uh, the granite outcrop that's the home of all those rattlesnakes uh, that used to be and might still be as we hear today. Uh, this is actually High Rock, which is right near the, uh, uh, the sawmill site. And that ridge, uh, okay, this is from the top of High Rock. Uh, when I first started going out there in the 80s, uh, when we were in the process of acquiring Weedamoo, the, the, the various parcels that, that are today Weedamoo Woods, uh, that was open and you could see out to the ocean. That's the mouth of the Sakonet River there. You can see through the, uh, the, the treetops. You can only see that now in the wintertime when there's no leaves on the tree. So um, used to be able to see all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean from High Rock. Here's more of the glacial, ri glacial ridge, the granite outcrops that uh, run up and down uh, through the area. And I mean, that just looks like a good home for a rattlesnake, doesn't it? Some of it is really sheer. Uh, some really quite striking uh, uh, geological uh, formations out there. All, this is, all that stuff dates back 14,000 years ago to when the, the glacier, the last glacier era ended. And, the earth started to warm and the, the glaciers started to recede, leaving these, leaving these, uh, leaving Narragansett Bay for one thing, and uh, all along the eastern side of the East Bay, leaving this this prominent ridge. And from that that ridge that we were just looking at there, you can see out over the this one's even higher, and there's swamp down below that. Uh, this actually was taken from uh, the most recent pr uh, property that the Tiverton Land Trust. Uh, purchased this last year. Another look back toward Main Road. That house there is on Main Road. Uh, okay, this is a uh, an outcropping of quartz, which uh, was one of the very valuable stones for Native Americans because it would uh, 
It was easy to work into tools where you needed an edge like arrowheads and spear points and so on when you'd, when you'd, uh, uh, if you knew how to, how to work the, uh, the basic rock, you could chip it off. And there's a, there's a good deposit in Weedamu Woods. And even more interesting, uh, around that deposit are, this is clearly a Native American quarry for quartz. So at one point in time, before European settlement, this is where they would go, uh, shear off the quartz, uh, trade it for whatever, and, uh, or take it home, and, and some of the evidence is still there. This has been verified by uh, one of the state archaeologists who came down and, and cited it. And so it's a, you know, it's a little remnant there of the pre-colonial era that's really pretty special. Another little, uh, the ball cap there is not Native American, that's mine. It's put, put there for size reference. And stone fence. Okay, you see these all over the place in New England. Uh, New England was pretty much cleared in the colonial era of, of, the, of, the, of the forests that they found here, uh, farms, settlement. So, I mean, nothing particularly unusual about seeing stone walls out in the middle of the woods, but the, the collection of stone walls that we have is what's, what's interesting, and the fact that they are still there kind of un, unimproved from the time that they were active, actively being uh, used as farms and pastures. This is a, a cart path. Uh, you see how it's kind of dished out? It's amazing how these cart paths that were really well used in, in that era, uh, the soil is compressed and it never grows back. Of course, the animals continue to use those old trails and so on, so it, it, it remains, uh, it keeps that character. And those are all over Weedamoo Woods. There's a whole network of them going various directions to the various farm sites and so on. And here's one that is really well used. Look how far below the surrounding terrain that is. So that was a cart path that had a lot of heavy traffic. And uh, this actually is coming from those cellar holes that are over on the, the red trail. And I suspect that's the way that that farm came by the sawmill and went down to Four Corners. And there were probably other farm sites over there, so it was really a well-used uh, well path. Now here's a cart path that actually has cobbling in it. See the stones there, the granite, little pieces of granite? Now that one was undoubtedly affiliated with the sawmill where they were, they were uh, carrying out product from the mill in you know, heavy loads and lots of traffic. So in order to use it with that kind of traffic in, in, you know, during wet seasons and so on, they put these uh, these granite stones down, these are probably beach stones, and uh, it would uh, help them use it. Uh, here's another one. This is, this also is going east from the sawmill. So uh, there was heavy traffic going both directions there uh, on either side of the sawmill. Also, all around Weedamoo Woods, you find these little slab bridges. Now this is kind of hard to see, but this is on, if, if you're familiar, this is on the green trail, but uh, this is one of our, our trails, and this is a cart path. Uh, and they, they have, this is Borden Brook running down through the swamp, and there's a slab bridge right there. So it's a, it's a minor one, but uh, you know, this is probably pretty early, and it was just for local traffic, local carts going to and from, uh, the farms and so on. But uh, there's a number of those uh, in Weedamoo. This is a major slab bridge. Uh, and again, this is on Eight Rod Way there, south of the sawmill, and undoubtedly was constructed as part of the sawmill operation. Because that, that's for heavy, heavy loads. And we actually use it today for maintenance, bringing trucks in and out. Um, Here's the other side of it. Borden Brook runs right down through there, uh, right out, and again, through Four Corners. 
It also powered the grist mill that was at Four Corners in the early days, uh, the brook does, and uh, um, on out into Nunquid <coughs> Pond. So this is, th this is quite, quite, look at the size of that stone there, uh, quite the uh, heavy, heavy duty uh, slab bridge. This is the cellar hole that's talking about earlier, uh, and this has a, a fairly extensive network of stone fences around it. Some small, small uh, areas where they might have had certain types of, you know, swine or, or uh, probably not sheep because they can pretty well climb stone walls, but uh, and maybe maybe garden, maybe surrounding a garden area to keep the animals out of it. Uh, but uh, that's, that's one of the better ones. Now this is the Scipio cook cellar hole. And um, obviously a more modest house or an a lot older house. Uh, and it, so it's, it's suffered the, the ravages of time a, a lot more. This one is really interesting though because there's a lot to look at around there that tells you a little bit about the history of, of that home site. Um, where, they, where the cellar hole is, is the, the soil level is kind of elevated a couple of feet. Then you walk through a stone wall and it sort of drops down. And that probably is because that soil there seems to be pretty good. And that was probably gardened for generations and generations and generations. So all the compost, all the mulch and so on slowly built this, the soil up. And there's lots of uh, daylilies that are still there. Uh, uh, there's some sedum plants that are still there. Those are, for some reason, Sedum and daylily, you see those a lot around old farm sites. I guess they were just good basic, uh, uh, you know, flowers and that, that, that survived uh, New England, but that you, you seem to see those a lot uh, around this area. I'm sorry? Well, it's possible because they are edible. Yeah, they're, they're kind of tasty. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. That's very possible, uh, Ginger. Um, they don't bloom much now because they're in the forest and they, you know, a daylily needs, pr pretty much needs full sun, but you can see them coming up every year. There's also a tree that's there called a sweet cherry tree, which is not a Native American cherry. And it's a tree that was brought over by the colonists because it has a, an edible, uh, fairly large cherry fruit. And a lot, around a lot of the old cellar holes, you see those, those trees dating back to that era. I mean, not necessarily the individual tree, but they dropped the cherries. And so there's always, not always, you commonly see that around, uh, around uh, these cellar home sites. Dug wells. Uh, some of these wells are still surviving. I mean, that's the way you got the water in those days. You dug a hole, you lined it with rock so it wouldn't slump in. And uh, that was your source of water. Um, so we see those uh, around. And here's a really interesting one. Now, this is the Brown Farm. This is that farm right off of Lafayette Road. Ron, I, I never did quite finish answering your question on Brown's Lane. I think Brown's Lane uh, obviously was named after the Brown family that lived there uh, and was recorded in 1895. I'm not sure when it started to be called Lafayette Road. Uh, Lafayette was here during the Revolution and he actually came back during his grand tour of America. I think it was 1825, something like that. And I don't know whether it was for the tour or for during the Revolutionary Era that he was quartered in, a, in that house there just south of Lafayette Road. Um, it's, um, it's an, it's an, it's the, there's a house on the corner of Lafayette and Main Road and the, the one just to the north of that on that eastern side of the road. It's a derelict house now. Uh, well, it's called the Lafayette House because Lafayette was there. Uh, and again, I'm not sure which time, but, and at some point in time, they start calling that road Lafayette Road, I think because of that house. So that's, that's my understanding of how that ended up being Lafayette Road. But this is the Brown House, and this this also is a is a uh, farm site that is has really extensive 
stone wall, uh, a, an extensive stone wall network. Two big wells. Um, this is a midden that's, that's nearby that side. A midden is where they dump the trash. You know, they didn't have trash pickup in those days, so uh, it went out. Of course, they didn't have the volume of trash that we have either, but everybody took care of their own trash. And uh, so they're, they're also uh, a, a great source of learning about uh, that. And, you know, someday maybe it might be appropriate to, uh, to dig through that with the right kind of people uh, analyzing it to uh, see what's there. But that's what you see there is mostly clamshells, I think. Uh, but you know, you might find metal implements down there, pieces of dishes and so on, so. There's one of the dug wells at the Brown Settlement. Uh, big time, I mean, really a large well, and here's the other one. Uh, so that was quite an operation. Uh, I mean, quite a farm uh, there that uh, was, was there up until 1895. Uh, I actually uh, have, it was a, an acquaintance of mine uh, who would be about probably 85 if he were still alive today, and he told me about his father uh, was on the Tiverton Town Council in the early 20th century and said that the building on the farm, uh, the Brown Farm, was still intact then and there was a bunch of squatters that would continually come in there. And the, one of the things the town council had to do periodically is have the police go down there and run them out. Uh, so it was, there was still a building there into the 20th century. It's, it's no longer there now. Here's a, just, you know, the, you see these patterns of stones uh, that you wonder they had some purpose. This is, up Eight Rod Way, uh, up on the Picasso Ridge area, uh, near that that large stone wall network that I have drawn in on the map, uh, and I'm really curious about finding out about that one someday. And, and uh, that information is available for someone who could go back and trace the uh, the land evidence records and find out, you know, through that route, uh, probably pin down when that was an active farm. One of the <coughs> difficulties of researching this history is the fact that, uh, of course, East Bay was not Rhode Island until I think it was 1847. And so the, land the earliest land evidence records aren't held by Tiverton. Uh, they are, in fact, over in Taunton. So to go way back to the earliest colonial era, you got to go over there and, and do your land evidence work. Uh, hopefully someday that, that'll be done and we can piece a lot more of this together. Uh, this is really an interesting one. All right, this is a stone abutment here. This is a roadway that's grown up over. It actually, my guess is it's not a roadway, it's a ramp. Uh, that goes right down into a very low, wet section of Cedar Swamp. And the reason why I say it's probably not a roadway is it goes right down into the Cedar Swamp. Uh, my s supposition is that it was put in as part of the sawmill. Uh, Cedar Swamp is named because, named as such, uh, because it had Atlantic white cedar in it. There's Atlantic white cedar. Atlantic white cedar is a very valuable wood, particularly in colonial times, because it was very easily worked. It made great shakes. It was split, uh, very, it split very nicely. Uh, it's a soft wood, but it was a strong wood. Very rot resistant, highly valuable. And I suspect that Probably the sawmill came in because of the cedar that was in Cedar Swamp. I mean, I'm sure they harvested everything that could be sold, but that, that would be particularly valuable to come in and harvest all that Atlantic white cedar. The sawmill, mm -hmm. uh, that's just amazing. Uh, there's the, the race. There's really an interesting 
dry wall bridge structure that has survived. Actually, it survived uh, and one lady that's with us today, Marge Larson, was instrumental in getting it restored uh, about 10 years ago, Marge, maybe? Anyway, uh, it was, it was uh, restored to its uh, original look. It was, what was happening is when we first acquired the property, there were trees and stuff growing up out of it. There was a beech tree, and of course that gets the roots into the stone and so on, so it had to, and it's just, you, you know, you can't just cut down the tree. Uh, the roots will still be there, so uh, they put together a plan and, and got it restored, so it, it, uh, that was a great uh, uh, improvement. This is the, uh, the mill dam to dam Borden Brook to hold the water so that they could use the mill a lot more. I mean, that's a common uh, tactic there for uh, getting more use out of the mill throughout the year. But look at the size of those stones, talking four or five feet across. Consequently, I'm awfully sure that even though that 1895 map says abandoned mill site, I don't think it was too long before that that this mill was built. Uh, it's, it's just too big and it's, it's not early, it wasn't an early village sawmill like most villages had. This is, this is I think, in a later era. Here's a, from the lower side of it, there's the, there's the race. This is also quite interesting to me, those wooden posts are still there. Uh, they either have to be white oak or chestnut. Uh, that's the only thing that would not have rotted by now, uh, being that age. I mean, 1895, it was gone. The mill site was gone. So sometime before that, so we're talking 100, you know, 150 years or whatever the math is, uh, and those posts are still there. That's pretty, uh, pretty good. That's better than pressure-treated wood, I think. And here's the down below the bridge. You can see the, the post there and the race coming down through there. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing to, uh, to see that uh, and visualize uh, a mill operating there. Okay, uh, turn the lights on please. Questions that, I, that I've kind of gone over, uh, why were cellar holes near the swamp? Uh, why was the area abandoned? Why was A-Rod Way never improved to modern standards and, you know, like the rest of the town developed? Uh, and when was the sawmill built? Uh, those are the things that have intrigued me as I've kind of gotten more and more familiar with what's down there. And I have I have a scenario that I think kind of fits everything. Uh, I mean, in terms of what I know about uh, the town history, the history of the forests around here, and uh, what I see down there. And first of all, I think um, Cedar Swamp wasn't nearly as big as it is today when they first started Settle 8 Rod Way. I think that Eight Rod Way, I also, I mean, it's really pretty, it's really not too much of a mystery when you start crawling around down there a lot and look at, look at the terrain and the granite and the outcrops in the swamp to realize that when they laid out the Pocasset Purchase and drew the lines and Eight Rod Way and so on, uh, it went through some places that didn't work topographically. So they had to go around uh, what would have been the stream, what would have been swamp, and what would have been granite. So the, so the cart paths of use were not the cart paths that were platted uh, on, the original, on the original division of the Pocasset Purchase. So I'm thinking that the, the first settlers down there came in, uh, the trails went kind of as close as they could, uh, the swamp wasn't really that big, uh, the, 
the, uh, that was forest at that time. They cleared, they had their farms. Uh, and that worked in an era when you had small subsistence farms, these little cellar holes, you say, my gosh. Uh, so I think those, those really small ones were probably our earliest ones. And um, another key thing that happened all over New England in the early 1800s was in a general abandonment of New England farms. By that time, the farms had been worked for over 100 years. Uh, the soil was depleted. There was a lot of erosion. Uh, the way they did soils in those days uh, was the husbandry techniques. Uh, wasn't one that, that really regenerated uh, the soils. Also, the Erie Canal went in, railroads went in in the 1800s, and a vast area out in the Ohio River Valley was opened up to farming. And the land was flat, <laughs> and there weren't any stones on it. <laughs> and you know, why fool around here when so a lot of the a lot of the farm, a lot of the agriculture of New England went west, and farms all over New England were abandoned. It's really interesting to uh, we were talking with uh, a surveyor that does surveying work for the Open Space Commission for the town, and he's done a lot of research of deeds in Tiverton. And he told me one time that the quality of the surveys went to pot in about 1840. <laughs> and I think it's because the good surveyors went west where all the new you know, land was being settled. There was a big demand for surveyors out there. So the ones that hung around, you couldn't find good surveyors, so you found someone that wasn't a good surveyor. <laughs> so uh, he has a... Uh, he says he experiences all kinds of trouble with the surveys and the deed records and so on after about 1840. So I think, I think that was, you know, was, and it did happen everywhere uh, all over New England. So I think some of those earliest farms sort of got abandoned and they're sitting there. I think looking at that mill site, uh, it probably went in sometime after 1860. Now the reason I say that is there's a there's a, a great big monumental historical tomb, the history of Newport County, Rhode Island. It's about this thick, and uh, one of our members of the Open Space Commission has a copy of that, and uh, I've read through the chapter on Tiverton, and there's no mention of a mill in Tiverton. They talk all about Four Corners and the the mill down there, the grist mill, and very, and I and I have to believe that if the mill existed there. Uh, that it would have been mentioned somewhere when they were talking about the Four Corners area. Um, so I think what happened was the farms were cleared early, the early settlements. I mean, that's what everybody did. You, you, you cut out all the trees, you established pastures, you, you, know, you cleared, uh, you had your little, your little plots, uh, subsistence farming. And in the early 1800s, uh, the general exodus of farms in New England. We saw that around here too. Uh, and so a lot of those farms that were active uh, got abandoned and the forest came back. Now if that happened in the early 1800s, by, by the late 1800s you'd, you'd have some pretty good second growth forest out there and perhaps a great stand of Atlantic white cedars. So I'm thinking that that opportunity was there uh, for whoever built the mill in sometime maybe 1865, somewhere maybe after the Civil War, uh, that mill went in and it was probably a fairly short-term operation. Uh, they cleared all the, the swamp, the Atlantic White Cedar, and uh, it went away before 1895, the date of the, of the map. So, I think that probably is a fairly good sequence. Now that big farm on north of Lafayette Road, it might have hung on longer because it was, it was a more extensive farm. The, the Scipio Cook cellar hole, uh, there was an itinerant preacher that was the preacher uh, at the Old Stone Church, the Baptist Church down on Old, Old Stone Church Road in the 1880s, and he kept a diary. So maybe some of you have seen the, the diary of uh, Peleg Burroughs uh, diary. He kept a daily uh, journal of where he went, who he visited, and so on. 
he visited Scipio Cook, a man of color, uh, which means he was either black or Native American or both. Uh, he lived in that house there. That tells me that it wasn't in a substantial home, and it was probably a very modest thing that he had gotten, you know, later on. So I'm thinking, already in the 1880s, that was probably not the growth corridor of Tiverton. It was pretty much uh, 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 abandoned. Yeah. Excuse me. That was late 1700s. What? Taylor Burroughs diary. It was Revolutionary War time. Late 1700s. Yeah. 1778 to 1800. Okay, I'm, I'm. All right, well, it was all right. Then it was already. Uh, it was already uh, not. A, I, I, I apologize for that. I thought I'd had that in the 1880s. I'm sorry. There are two copies of his diary at the Essex Library. If anyone cares to look. Yeah. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, those are recent acquisitions then, because. Uh, Art Watteker, he he kept having to get one from another. Uh, yeah, so that's good though. Yeah, they are there. Uh, yeah, it's pretty dull reading. Yeah, very. Uh, I have. A, very. I have. A, I actually have Art Watteker's copy. I've got to get back to him. Um, uh, but anyway, I think that that um, was probably a, a, along that time. Um, not not a substantial farm. I mean, looking at the, the farm site uh, would say, I mean, the uh, cellar hole would, would indicate that. As far as the mystery of why there's houses right up against the swamp, uh, I think the mill did that. Uh, the, the mill dam was to hold the water. Uh, that significantly changes the surface flow and the drainage that's in an area. And you have hillsides and so on. And they were restricting the uh, the flow sometimes completely, and so uh, eventually, over not too many years, the swamp gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So these these uh, cellar holes that you say, gosh, you're right next to the swamp, sometimes sort of in it. I think maybe it was not that big uh, when those farm sites were uh, established there. So, yes, ma'am. You don't think the uh, mill? There's no way it was an earlier mill. I mean, it's just the size of the rocks. That my understanding is that when uh, that there were all sorts of abandoned mills, abandoned really early, like the 1700s, that when they did that first clear cutting, there was flash flooding all over New England, caused by the lack of trees. So all these mills that had been put in for the clear cutting mm -hmm. were then abandoned because of the flash flooding and then no water. Yeah. So is it because of the size of the rocks that you think that? Um, no, the fact that it's not mentioned in that history of Newport County. Uh, it could have been abandoned by then. Well, it could have been, but I just think maybe, I mean, because they, it's the history, it's not the current condition. And it was a fairly extensive history that went all the way back to the Pocasset Purchase. And oh, so that was, that was one of the main arguments. I've, I've had trouble figuring out why that's not recorded anywhere. The way to find it is to go to Taunton and, you know, go back through the records. But uh, I just, uh, you know, I think the size of that those stones and the, you know it, it, that's a fairly heavy I you know that earliest colonial era I'm not sure they'd be have the the industrial I mean they could probably have done it I guess I mean they still were doing it with oxen in the, the various ways they haul those stones around so it's possible it also there was a little a little study done by some brown students was it Marge it, it was a there was a was it Roger, uh, Roger Williams, I guess it was. And they did, it was a group of students that, that put this thing together. And they put it in the 18th century. Uh, and the particular type of turban that they uh, postulated because of the shape of the walls and so on, they said it was a, a, one of these vertical design where you had a, uh, I mean, reciprocal, a reciprocating saw rather than uh, um, one that, circular. circular, yeah. And so that is an 18, I think those came along about 1820. So if that's correct, it would be sometime between 1820 and 1895. And, you know, it's always possible that that, that book just didn't mention it. So, uh, but 
One of the things that is, I'm looking forward to is I've just recently made initial contact with uh, the person who's the chair of the uh, Historical and Cultural Preservation Department at Salve Regina. And he's interested in talking with us to see, to see about uh, eventually studying this in some more depth. And this would be someone who's very highly qualified to make some judgments like that and also maybe through student research and so on, start to piece together some of this. So I, I hope that that develops and uh, uh, we find out more about that. But that's, uh, I don't, you know, I'm just, th those are my thoughts as kind of how it sort of fits together. Uh, it could be early. I'm, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be back in the 18th century though. Uh, so, um, I'll hang around and respond to questions. Uh, please uh, enjoy the goodies a little bit more before you go. We uh, thank you very much for coming and look forward to, uh, to more of this.